Amen. How many of you are glad you came to church already this morning? Amen. I know that I am. The Lord spoke into my heart. A uh, couple of things. Uh, don't forget, right after this morning's service, we'll have a five-minute meeting for anybody that's going on the church retreat. That'll be over on my right-hand side, your left in that section. Please make your way there as soon as possible. Just have some real quick, we've got an agenda, itinerary, some information that you're going to need to know. How many of you are going on that trip, by the way? That's going to be a wonderful time, so we're looking forward uh, to that coming up here in just a few weeks. We are staring right down at August uh, of 2024, which seems absolutely impossible, uh, but here we are. Um, another thing, I wanted to thank everybody who was out as part of the work day. We had a great crowd out for the uh, family uh, breakfast, and uh, thankful for all the men that labored in preparing the breakfast, all those who were here, and uh, what a great and wonderful time for our church family, and uh, thank you uh, for the great music this morning, uh, church, and uh, Amber and Natalie, great job uh, with your special. It's um, uh, sometimes when I preach after a song service like that, I think, how can you follow that? And, uh, but I know the message I have this morning is from the Lord and what He has for us. Turn your Bibles to Luke 18. Luke chapter number 18. Of course, we're still in our series on the parables of Jesus. How many of you enjoyed uh, our study so far in some of the parables? I know that I've received uh, some understanding in some areas regarding these parables uh, that maybe I uh, had a lack of understanding or misinterpretation previously. So it's been helpful uh, to me, and I pray that it has been to you as well. There's some uh, unique qualities about uh, this parable uh, that make it distinct from others. And we'll see some of those right away in Luke 18, verse number 1. It says, And he spake a parable unto them to this end, that men ought always to pray and not to faint. Boy, there's a great verse for us to remember this morning, isn't it? Uh, it's interesting here that we find out in verse number 1 that he tells us uh, the purpose of the parable before he even gives us the parable. It says that he spoke the parable to this end, that men ought always to pray and not to faint. Uh, boy, I think every one of us could be challenged in our prayer lives, couldn't we? Every one of us would say that sometimes we fall short when it comes to prayer. It does not say here that men ought sometimes to pray. It doesn't say that when times are difficult that we ought to pray. It doesn't say that when things are really bad or when things are really good or in the morning when we get up. And it doesn't say at night when we go to bed. But it says that this parable given by Jesus Christ himself this morning was given for this purpose, for this reason. And the reason is this, the parable that was given so many years Years ago, and that we'll look at this morning as given by Christ gives us this understanding that men ought always to pray. That means if times are good, we ought to do what? Church, we ought to do what? We ought to, we ought to pray. When times are bad, we ought to do what? We ought to pray. When somebody's in office that we like, we ought to do what? We ought, when somebody's in the office that we don't like, we ought to do what? We ought to pray. Men ought always to pray. We'll look at it here in just a second. It essentially gives us two different options. And I tell you, I really like the first option better than the second. It says men ought always to pray and not to faint. Verse number two says, saying, There was in a city a judge which feared not God, neither regarded man. If you want to know, the political landscape of our world today, just circle verse number two. I don't care what side of the aisle you fall on. Here we had a standard politician. He didn't fear God, and he didn't regard man. Verse number three, and there was a widow in that city, and she came unto him saying, avenge me of mine adversary. She was asking for justice in something that had transpired in her life. Verse number four, and he would not for a while. But afterward he said within himself, Though I fear not God, nor regard man, he even understood his own condition, yet because this widow troubleth me, I will avenge her, lest by her continually coming she weary me. Verse number 6, And the Lord said, Hear what the unjust judge saith. And shall not God... Avenge his own elect, which cry day and night unto him, though he bear long with them. If I were to ask us about Jesus and about prayer, 
Most of us would probably first think about the model prayer that Jesus gave to his disciples and gave to us. Maybe we would think about Jesus in prayer and the fact that he went to the Garden of Gethsemane in great anguish, right? And he took some a little further in prayer, but then yet he went even beyond and they fell asleep and he continued in prayer. When we talk about Jesus in prayer, I don't think many would consider this passage, this parable that's often overlooked, this teaching of the Lord Jesus Christ that if we were not careful, we wouldn't be aware of its truths. You know, this is a parable of contrast. What do you mean a parable of contrast, Pastor? In a parable of contrast, often it'll say the kingdom of heaven is like unto, or it'll use a... um, uh, 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 a husbandman that went into a, a far country, and it compares, it doesn't compare, but it, it draws a correlation between a certain earthly illustration and our Heavenly Father or our Savior Jesus Christ, right? But here, in talking about the unjust judge, it's giving us a contrast in how even an unjust judge and what they would do are in contrast to our Heavenly Father and what He would do for us. There was a a small town, and this small town had just one judge. The judge was in his office one day, and just outside of his office was a reception area, and he had his secretary. And an old widow woman came in late in the afternoon, and he knew that soon he would go home. And she spoke to the receptionist, and she said, I would like to see the judge. And uh, she calls back and says, there's a widow lady from town here. She'd like to see you. And uh, he said, tell her I don't, I don't have time. I've got other things going on. I cannot see her. So the receptionist says, he, he's busy for the rest of the day, but thinking she wouldn't return, she said to her, maybe you could come back tomorrow. Tomorrow at 8 a.m., as they were just starting things in the office. The judge went into his office and the secretary was sitting outside and guess who showed up? This little widow lady. And again, the secretary calls back and and says, uh, you're not going to guess who's here, but she's back. The judge says, well, tell her that I've got appointments this morning and that I, I cannot see her. So she Tells her that he's got appointments that morning and he, he can't see her. And she said, that's okay, I've got time. She said, I'll just wait here. A couple hours went by and she calls back to the judge and says, hey, this, this widow lady is still here. And uh, the judge says, well, he says, uh, it's not that far from lunchtime. She's probably going to get hungry and she'll probably leave. A couple hours go back go by and the receptionist is sitting there at her desk and she hears some rustling of what she thought was papers and she looked over and uh, the lady had a had a lunch with her (laughs) she was taking it out of out of the bag and she was eating it and uh she calls back to the judge and says you're not gonna believe it but i think this lady is serious she's she's got her lunch with her and he says oh man he says i gotta get out of here for a lunch appointment he says, i tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to leave through the fire escape. So he leaves out the back through the fire escape. The lady doesn't see him. This goes on for a week. Every day he goes out to lunch through the fire escape, trying to avoid this lady. Pretty soon, people in this small town started to talk. It's not a good look for a judge to be leaving through the fire escape in the middle of the day. Finally, after a week, he said, I don't want to, but I'm going to have to see this lady because I don't think she's going away. We see a similar illustration here given by this unjust judge. He wasn't concerned about justice, but he was concerned about what? Himself. I want to look at just some few things A few things this parable and other portions of Scripture teach us regarding prayer. 
First of all, we're going to look at the need of prayer. In 18.1, we read it already, and he spake a parable unto them to this end, that men ought always to pray and not to faint. You know, the best thing we can do for our nation is to pray. The best thing we can do for our own struggles and trials and temptations is to pray. I said earlier, we essentially have, and we do, two choices, to pray or to faint. It's easy to look at the world and to be discouraged. The word faint here means to lose heart, to give up, to get discouraged. Anybody ever look around and get discouraged by what you see around you? I can imagine a young person going to school and the temptation and the wickedness and the evil and all that exists within our school systems and to easily be discouraged, to lose heart and to faint. Teenagers, you have two choices. You can either faint and give up or you can pray. And what this teaches is that when we pray, God hears. When God hears, he moves. I thought, what does it mean to lose heart? I think there's two ways that we can lose heart or that we can faint. We can faint instead of pray. And we see many do this. But I believe also that we can faint in prayer. Often we lose heart because we believe that God does not hear. Often we get discouraged because we think he has not answered our prayer. Often we expect for the prayer to come through the avenue and the way that we have dictated to God in our hearts that it should. And if it doesn't come that way, well, then God has let us down. And God is not just and God is not right. Church this morning, know this. When God answers your prayer and he doesn't answer it your way, he is still just and he is still right and he still knows what is best for your life. Sometimes we faint instead of pray. and Sometimes I believe that we faint when we pray. Not only do we see this great need of prayer that's established from the very beginning of this text, that men ought to always to pray. The scripture tells us to pray without what? To pray without ceasing. It reminds me of the story, I think it was Andrew Murray, who was known for his being a great man of prayer. And there was a young man in seminary, and he said, I want to be able to pray like Andrew Murray. And he said, I want to be able to, to follow in his footsteps and get a hold of God like he did. And so he followed him around all day long. He followed him around, and he kept wanting to hear him pray. And he thought, well, maybe here in the morning I'm going to hear him pray. And right before lunch I'll hear him pray. And he's getting ready to go into a meeting about some needs that there are in his ministry. And I'm going to tune my ear in because because I want to hear him pray. Guess what happened all day? He didn't hear him pray. He thought, that's strange. He made his way into the room where Andrew Murray stayed. Got under his bed. He thought, certainly tonight, I'll hear him pray. That bed when he, that evening when he went to bed, He simply heard him whisper these words. In Jesus' name, amen. And he went to bed. You know why? Because prayer wasn't a routine. And prayer wasn't a journal. And prayer wasn't something that he was required to do to check the box, to be a good Christian. But prayer was the way that he lived his life. He saw there was a true, genuine need for prayer. When the Bible says that men ought always to pray, they ought to always pray. We ought to continually be in communion with our Heavenly Father to make our needs known to Him, to give thanks and praise to Him for what He's done, to have conversation with Him. Our mind, by the religious institutions of this world, has become so polluted in regards to the philosophical understanding of exactly what is prayer. Prayer isn't when I fall on my knees at the altar, although it can be and it should be, but prayer is what I do all day, every day, to be ready to speak with God, to hold communion and sit, if we could say, across the table in the chair next to him and have a conversation and tell him about what's going on, knowing and understanding that he cares. Not only do we see the need for prayer, but we see the obstacles of prayer. If I asked you what were the obstacles to you praying more, what would you say? What would you say? Life. Life in itself is an obstacle, isn't it? I think I wrote down the same thing from the Scripture as you did, Tom, but I put it this way, time. 
Oh, if I had more time, I would pray. What does Ephesians 5, 15 through 17 say? That we ought to walk circumspectly, not as fools, redeeming the time. You ever redeemed something? It's to exchange something for something else, to redeem. I played in a, a golf tournament, and there was a, a prize that you could win. You could win $20,000 for a hole-in-one. If you got a hole-in-one, you could exchange or redeem it for what? $20,000. That'd be a pretty good exchange, wouldn't it? You say, Pastor, how many hole-in-ones did you have? I didn't have any. <laughs> you say, Pastor, how many hole-in-ones have you ever had? And I tell you, I've not had any. <laughs> Our time, we give in exchange for something else. It saddens my heart to see what Christians exchange their time for. We exchange our time for sleep. We exchange our time for video games. We exchange our time for sports. We, can, we exchange our time or redeem our time. Don't get mad at me for social media, TV, the news home projects. Hey, is there ever an end for things to do? Never an end. I, I feel like we run, my family, I feel like we run from 6 a.m. to 11 or 12, uh, 6, 6 a.m. to 11 or 12 p.m. every day. We say, where's the time gone? Today's over. Hey, I exchanged that time for something. Don't laugh about 6 a.m., Dustin. I know what you're thinking. <laughs> Dustin wanted me to work out with him. Because if you look at Dustin, stand up. Stand up, Dustin. Don't be shy. <laughs> okay, you can sit down. <laughs> he said, he looked, now this is a true story, kind of. He looked at my physique and my build, and he said, Pastor, would you work out with me? And I said, if I did, it would have to be at 6 o'clock in the morning. And he said, uh, 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 what? <laughs> and a couple days later, he texted me and said, hey, are you going to be at the gym at 6 in the morning? And I texted him back and said, no. <laughs> People get up early, work out. You know what they're doing? They're redeeming their time for something. Teenagers, what do you redeem your time for? We have all the excuses in the book, don't we? I don't have enough money. I don't have the same amount of abilities and talents as other people do. I, I don't have the same charisma or ability to be able to stand and teach or connect with people. It's just not me. You know the great equalizer? Time. Uh, I don't have any more time in the day than Glenn Neal does. We both get 24 hours. The question is, how are we using it? Amen. We say that time is an obstacle to prayer, but the truth is this, our carnal flesh is an obstacle to prayer. Right. What we want to do ourselves, how we want to live our lives often interrupts the holy life that we should be living that's surrendered to God in prayer. Time. I think there's mental difficulties that can often be an obstacle to prayer. Discouragement, depression, spiritual warfare. You know what Satan says? You prayed last time and it didn't work. Why are you wasting your time now? Can I tell you, prayer always works. It may not work to the end that we think. You've heard me say it before. Faith is not trusting God for the outcome that we desire. Faith is trusting God no matter what the outcome is. You said that fear is what if, and faith is even if.
James 4 tells us that a lack of faith is an obstacle to God hearing our prayers. He says what, that we ask it, that we could consume it upon our own lusts? It says that we ask amiss without faith? Do we believe that when God says that he'll answer prayer that he will? And why don't we live that way? We see the perseverance of prayer. In verse number four, we go, I'm sorry, in the obstacles to prayer, we look at this, this widow woman. She had every reason not to go to the judge and ask, but she still did. What are our obstacles or excuses in prayer? Verse number four said, And he would not for a while, but afterward he said within him, Self, though I fear not God nor regard man, yet because this widow troubleth me, I will avenge her, lest by her continually coming she weary me. We see the perseverance of prayer. Have you heard of pray and hide before? Anybody heard of pray and hide? Pray and hide was a young man that grew up as a pastor's son in Illinois. And a pray and hide, his brother was in seminary. And pray and hide's brother died while he was in seminary. And God began to work in pray and hide's life. And he challenged him and he said, why don't you go and take your brother's place? So he went to seminary. In seminary, God got a hold of his heart for prayer, for missions, and he prayed and he prayed and he prayed. He challenged his classmates in seminary, and it said that over 50% of his classmates when they graduated went to the foreign field to serve God as a missionary. He found himself in what's known in modern day, in modern day as Pakistan, and in India. When he got there, he began to pray even more than he had before. It was said that before a revival meeting, he put himself in his prayer closet and prayed continually day and night for 30 days. In 1909, great revival swept through modern-day Pakistan and India, an area that was void of the gospel, filled with pagan and false religions, Turn their heart to God because a man was willing to pray. When he was 43 years old, that strikes a different chord with me. I'm 43 years old. They found out that he had a brain tumor. He said that preceding his death, he prayed for one soul every day. And in that first year, God gave him 400. Said then he prayed for two souls, and God answered his prayer. And then he prayed for four souls every day, and God answered his prayer again. One day, medical research and knowledge not being what it is today, his cancer took his life. When he died, it was revealed that there was another contributing factor to his death. It wasn't just the brain tumor. But the doctors saw something they had never seen before. He died of a heart condition where his heart had literally shifted inside of his chest cavity. They said the reason was because his favorite way to pray was bowed down on his face before God. And that he spent so many hours in that position that eventually his heart shifted inside of his body. And the prayers of pray and hide didn't just shift his heart, but it shifted the heart of God. And men repented, and families were reached, and the world was impacted. And a testimony stands even today from a man who said day or night, he said men ought always to pray. 
His life lives as an example. I can tell you, as a as an eight-year-old boy sitting in Sunday school class, and they had them little flip book stories. Anybody know what I'm talking about? That told about missionaries, and they told about praying hide. How God used him to reach India. I remember as a little boy thinking, well, that's something I can do. I could pray. I don't know your economic standing this morning. I don't know your biblical training today. I don't know how long each and every one of you have been saved or even what your testimony is, but I know this, that every one of us has the same resource, and that resource is to get on our face before a holy God and pray. What could we do? What could happen? What would God do if we would simply pray? What if it was simply that whatever you wanted was at your disposal? You just had to ask for it. Guess what? That's what prayer is. If we ask anything according to His will, the Bible says what? That'll do it. Do we believe that? What about Hannah? All she wanted was a son. Often we think that God is limited by medical. She's praying there in the temple. And Eli sees her. And she's praying and her mouth is moving, but she's not even saying any words. And what does Eli say? How long will you be drunken? I guess if I was going to be drunk... Praise God, in 43 years, I never have. Praise God, in 43 years, I've never touched a drop of alcohol. And I can tell you this, I've been just fine without it, and I think I'll just continue to be fine without it. I don't care what a church across town says. I don't care what the new pastor that comes out and says it's okay to drink wine. I don't care what other people say. I think I'll be just fine without it. But if I was going to be drunk, I guess I'd want to be drunk with prayer. To be controlled by the Spirit of God, in communion with Him. Hannah prayed, what happened? God gave her a son. I don't even know the words that she prayed. She prayed many prayers. The Bible says that even when we don't know what to say, that the Spirit makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Hey, that is not tongues. The Spirit is doing the groanings. It means that when we don't know what to say or even how to pray, you ever been there before? The Spirit of God knows our heart and He'll pray for us. Remember this. Have you ever heard somebody get up in public and make a big lofty prayer? Anybody ever heard that before? And you think, wow, that was really uncomfortable (laughs) hey listen to this let's not forget it's not the length of our prayer but it's the depth of our prayer it's not the words of our prayer but it's the attitude of our heart and prayer that a holy God hears last of all and I'm done we see the, the God of prayer what do we mean the God of prayer? I mean the one that we pray to. Turn to Mark 11. We've got several scriptures here. Mark 11. Oh, that we would be like praying, hide, and persevere in prayer. Remembering the God of our prayer. Mark 11. I'm going to ask you a question. Everybody looking this way. Do you believe the Word of God? Do you believe what the Bible says? All right. Mark 11. Verse number, let's start in verse number 22. And Jesus answering saith unto them, Have faith in God. For verily I say unto you that whosoever shall say unto you, This mountain be thou removed, and be thou cast into the sea, 
and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he saith. Therefore I say unto you, what things soever ye desire, when ye pray, believe that ye receive them, and ye shall have them. Can I ask you the same question? Do you still believe the Word of God? Amen. Our biblical understanding of prayer, I think, is very shallow. A text like this ought to give us faith and confidence in prayer. But often, instead, it causes us to hang our head in doubt regarding prayer. That which God gave us to strengthen and encourage us to do so, if we're not careful, we'll allow it to discourage us. You say, Pastor, if I pray for a new Lamborghini, will God give it to me? I can assuredly tell you no. You say, Pastor, how do you know that? Because I've done it 11 times. <laughs> and I am persevering in prayer. But here's what we have to remember. We, the Bible, we have to compare Scripture with Scripture. It tells us we ought to pray and ask according to what? The will of God, right? Sometimes my heart is not surrendered enough to God to want His desire instead of mine. I want the Lamborghini. He wants me to submit to him and what he has for my life, right? We live in a church culture in our country and around the world that's a name it and claim it faith. It's unfortunate that those within that culture, the only ones who are claiming it are the ones who are preaching it and they're claiming it right out of the pockets of those that they're preaching to. Their congregants typically live in poverty. You say God doesn't want to give us good things? He does. The problem is we want what we think is good. God wants to give us what he knows is good. You ever thought something was good for you? Come to find out it wasn't. It happens to me every time I sit down at the table. <laughs> Walt and Donna Gray had us over to their house on Friday for lunch. Had a wonderful time of fellowship. I ate about 20 pounds of food. They just kept, it was like a 17-course meal. They just kept bringing stuff out from Hawaii, the Philippines, you name it. Uh, I don't even know what some of it was. We just ate it. <laughs> He's like, we got hot dogs, hamburgers, we got uh, fried, uh, uh, we got grilled uh, steak, we've got uh, potatoes, we got eggs, we've got peaches, and we got bananas, and we got these little hunks of meat from the Philippines, and we got these ice cream things from uh, Hawaii, and then they had, what, oh, we had them, them uh, deep fried, what are them things called, Brother Walt? Yes, yeah, we had them, <laughs> we had them, we had them too. <laughs> I sure thought it was good for me until I got home and had heartburn all night. <laughs> we appreciate their hospitality so much. It was a good time. But isn't that how it is in our life spiritually? There's so much we think is good for us because when we consume it, as James says, upon our lust, man, it makes us feel good. But there's something that, the things I really are good for me, a lot of times I don't like. <laughs> God knows what's best for us. He knows what's good. We ought to trust him when we pray, not trust our heart. The Bible says what? Our heart is deceitful above all and desperately wicked. Who can know it? You know what the world says? Follow your heart. You know what the Bible says? Don't follow your heart. It's wicked. Well, that sounds good, doesn't it? Follow. Just, just follow your heart. You think, oh, that's good. That's, I'm going to follow my heart. Don't do it. It's wicked. You know how we all know that and we laugh? Because our hearts led us to some pretty dark places, hasn't it? I'm going to start by reading the very first verse that we began with. I want you to ask yourself this question. Do you need to pray? We look in the... When we look in... 
uh, Luke chapter number 18, verse number 1. He spake a parable unto them to this end, that men ought always to pray, always to pray, and not to faint. Lord, this morning... I'm challenged, convicted in my heart, by my, my prayer life, with heads bowed and, and eyes closed. <clears throat>